that you would, uh, that you would comfort and, and, and be near to them. We, on, our, on our list, we also have Cindy Fout, who uh, broke a bone. I know that, Lord, and I just pray that uh, you would help her with her healing. And uh, I want to remember uh, Mitch Gibson, who's uh, still recovering, had surgery a week ago. And we've said many times he has a long way to go, Lord. And we just pray that you'll continue to bless him and strengthen him and give him healing. Pray for the rest of the people on our, on our list, Lord, our, our, college, our college of the week, Lord, Heartland Baptist Bible College. And I know our student of the week is, uh, oh, I can't remember. Oh, the Goodman, the Goodman boy out there. We want to ask, Lord, for your blessings on him and, uh, and others. We have college students all over, Lord. We pray that you, will, that you will help them, that you will bless them as they're away from home. Now, Lord, I pray that you'll help us as we uh, get into this lesson tonight about uh, spiritual liberty and... Uh, We'll talk about how we, should, how we should do it and how we shouldn't do it, Lord, and wh- how we shouldn't take advantage of things. I pray that you'll bless tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Okay, so we're going to be in uh, 1 Corinthians again, this time chapter, actually three chapters. We have been, talk- we have been going through one chapter a week. Uh, so far, and tonight we're going to somehow miraculously cover three chapters. At least that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, last week, you might remember, uh, we talked about the Corinthians had questions, and so they wrote to Paul. They asked Paul their questions, and uh, he talked about marriage. He talked about marriage. He said that marriage was normal. Marriage was normal. He said that marriage should last a lifetime, lifelong, until death do we part. Uh, I talked about uh, it, uh, how marriage is optional. Marriage isn't for everybody. Paul, he was single and he was happy, and he encouraged he encouraged others to be that way. Uh, he gave us instructions for for a believing couple how they should act in their marriage, how they should treat each other. He gave uh, examples for uh, an unbeliever who was married to a believer, and how they should behave and how they should stay in their marriage if they possibly can. Just because one was an unbeliever did not mean that they had to uh, terminate their marriage by any means. Talked about freedoms, whether they had the freedom to stay single or to marry. Uh, We remember that uh, there was a lot of persecution, and uh, Paul felt that that was one reason why it would be better if they were single. Because of the persecution, they didn't have to worry about a mate during some terrible times. Uh, talked about serving the Lord. He said it's okay to marry after your spouse dies. He talked about that. And, and whenever we remarry, to remarry in the Lord. And uh, not to always to seek his, his will and seek his uh, will in prayer. And he also said it's okay to remain unmarried, as he had. Tonight our theme is genuine Christian liberty operates within the bounds of love for others and for God. So we're going to get started as the as name of our uh, study is Out of Bounds. It's a, it's a sports type of uh, heading, I guess you would say. And so we're going to talk about ball hogs. We're going to talk about ball hogs for just a minute. In basketball, a ball hog is a player who won't give up the ball. He prefers to dribble around constantly until he finally forces up a shot or he runs out of time. The opposing team guards him and pretty much only guards him, meaning his shots are heavily contested and they rarely go in. What motivates a ball hog? Pure selfishness. Pure selfishness. To bring glory to himself instead of his team. What might, being, what might playing with a, bee, with a ball hog be like? And it would be very frustrating, as you can imagine. He wouldn't pass you the ball. He's only out there for himself. And it, uh, it would be very frustrating. Church members sometimes have a ball hog-like attitude as they live and serve. They forget they're on a team and the, responsible, and the responsibility for supporting and working with their teammates. Their goals are personal rather than team-oriented. This, this lesson encourages us to use selfless love to guide us in one, 
uh, to the one goal of glorifying God, particularly when dealing with questions about exercising Christian liberties or freedoms. In, in the NBA in uh, 2004, for the Atlanta Hawks, was a, a player named Bob Sura. Now, his name might be familiar. He did play for the Cavaliers for a little while, too. But in a game that they were winning by a large margin, he intentionally missed a layup basket in a blowout game so that he could catch the ball and get credit for a rebound. This credit for a rebound would have given him what we call a triple-double, means double digits in scoring, in points, double digits in assists, and double digits in rebounds. It would have been his third consecutive game with a triple-double. However, they nullified that and did not give him credit for the rebound, and I'm sort of glad they didn't. Kind of, uh, kind of a selfish thing. The Cavaliers also had a player named Ricky Davis. I don't have the year written down, but he intentionally missed a basket at the opponent's basket just to get a rebound, and they didn't credit him with that one either. Oh, well. Paul addressed how to address how to address questionable activities on which believers disagree. Following his instructions should strengthen and unify the church. All right, uh, so number one on our outline, Roman number one, is addressing Christian liberty problems. The issue of determining who is in the right in a struggle over Christian liberty is not an easy one. First, we must determine if the issue is truly one of liberty or of righteousness and sin. God ultimately determines what is sin, not any individual believer. But not all believers have the, have the same convictions about what is an acceptable practice and what God considers sin. Since differing believers are part of a team, they must be sensitive to each other's convictions. Paul helps us understand the need to be sensitive, be a sensitive member of the team. Therefore, we need to study 1 Corinthians chapter 8 through 10 carefully before attempting to exercise our Christian liberty. The Corinthians had written to Paul about another difficult question. Remember last week, the Corinthians had written to Paul, and his, his whole chapter was an answer, and that's similar tonight. Uh, was it right or wrong to eat food that had been sacrificed to idols? Some of the Corinthian believers reasoned that it did not make a particle of difference if they ate food that had been offered to idols. After all, they knew that the idol, that idol gods, did not exist. Some of their Christian friends, however, held a different opinion. Having worshipped idols before becoming Christians, these Christians felt that it was wrong to eat meat that had been sacrificed for idols. Their consciences would not let them do that. Do it. Knowledge alone could not solve the problem and unite the church. It merely puffed up some Corinthians. Thinking they, need, thinking they knew too much, the Corinthians failed to comprehend how much they still had to learn in skillfully applying that knowledge in their relationship with others. Let's read chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Verse 2, and if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing, yet as he ought to know. He who is most knowledgeable realizes how little he truly knows, and you know in your heart that that's true. What temptations might confront someone who has a solid knowledge of the Bible, but not a lot of experience in applying that knowledge? He might become pride. He might become proud, I'm sorry. A faulty sense of spirituality and maturity or impatience with those who, who aren't quite as knowledgeable as he is. It was customary for the heathens to have feasts often. When the feast was over, there was often food left. Sometimes the priests would sell it in the market. That's called the shambles, and we'll find out in chapter 10. Christians lived among the idolaters. They were relatives. They were neighbors. Some Christians were comfortable knowing that the idol is nothing. We all have knowledge. He said, you who take such liberty are not the only ones who have knowledge. We also who abstain know as much as you do of the vanity of, I of idols and that they are nothing. But we also know, know that the liberty that you take is deserving of blame. Nothing is worse than a know-it-all. 
And you know what I mean. Sometimes a know-it-all feels like he has to share all his knowledge with you, whether he knows it or, or whether he doesn't. And right now, somebody's coming to mind, and maybe in your mind also. To understand this entire section, it is essential to recognize the value that Paul placed on the individual's conscience. The conscience is like an alarm system that alerts a person to the fact that a thought or action is violating the standards set for the conscience. A weak conscience, which Paul discusses in uh, all these chapters, will malfunction by alerting a person to wrongdoing too easily. At work, where I work, we have a, it's a process, it's like it's a chemical process, and we have uh, on the computer set up a lot of alarms. Anytime a temperature goes out of range, anytime a pressure goes out of range or a level goes out of range, it brings in, it brings an alarm. And sometimes these alarms can become a nuisance. You have to acknowledge them. You have to check them out. Oh, I just did that five minutes ago. Oh, I know what that is. And you acknowledge it. Sometimes people get so sick of it, they just disable that alarm. And it can be trouble. It can be trouble because that, that alarm gets, that system gets worse and worse and worse. And nobody's aware of the alarm. And, that's, and that's, what, uh, that's what can happen if you, if, you, if you sear your conscience. We're going to read about that in just a minute. A, uh, a weak conscience, which Paul discusses in, in all these chapters, will malfunction by alerting a person to wrongdoing too easily. A seared conscience is one that no longer works correctly because it has been violated repeatedly. Let's look at 1 Timothy 4.2. It'll be on the screen. 1 Timothy 4.2, I'll read it. It's, we read this last week. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know what it is to be burned with a, a hot iron or with anything hot. I can remember in shop class in junior high, uh, we had a metal shop. And we had these rods, and we would get them hot, and we would beat them on an anvil and make them flat eventually drill a hole in it and make, we made uh, tools for the grill, a big sp long spatula and a pair of tongs, I can remember that. But I somehow burned a piece of metal, burned it off, and I didn't pay any attention, and I noticed it laying on the floor. And without thinking, I reached down and picked it up, and as soon as I did, I could smell burning flesh, and it was my flesh, and it hurt. But you know what? After that, after that initial hurt, I couldn't feel anything in those fingers. Like for the, for the rest of the week, it was like, it was nothing. There was no sensitivity there. That's because it had been seared. And that's what can happen to our conscience. It can be seared and, and uh, it no longer works correctly. Paul wanted to avoid that at any cost in his own life. I'm going to Acts chapter 24, 16. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards men. He didn't want to have any offense, whether it was to God or to man. Every believer should endeavor to strengthen his or her conscience by building it up on the word of God so that it functions properly under the direction of the Holy Spirit. What would you predict about the accuracy of a believer's conscience if that believer is not living in submission to the Holy Spirit? Well, it would become increasingly inaccurate because it either would alarm too often or it wouldn't alarm enough. In addition to studying scripture, what are some other ways that we can build a strong conscience? By listening to its alarms and then submitting to the spirit when he, when he prods us, when he pokes us, when he says, hey, you better get something right. The more we pay attention to our conscience, the louder the alarms will seem. Since no Christian's conscience is infallible, no one should attempt to force his or her views on another person unless those views are based on Scripture. Every Christian, as a believer priest under Christ, is given the dignity of determining his own mind on questionable matters. This takes us to the heart of the tensions in 1 Corinthians 1 and uh, chapter 8. What do we need to do when Christians differ on matters that seem important to them? So our number, or our letter B, I'm sorry, I probably didn't say letter A, knowledge is inadequate. Knowledge is inadequate. And now letter B is knowledge is necessary. 
The proud Corinthians needed to learn the importance of love. Love for God is essential, and God knows those who love him. Love helps us as believers to exercise our Christian liberty in ways that honor God. Let's read verse 3. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Liberty must be used with charity, with love. The Greeks worshipped numerous false gods, but Paul and the Corinthian believers knew that there was only one true God. Let's read verse 4. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. One God and one mediator, the man Christ Jesus, who comes before Almighty God and pleads my case. That's what we have, one God. Uh, in, in, we know that the false gods were energized by demons. We'll read about that a little later. The Corinthian believers also knew that, on, uh, that one true God controls everything and created everything through Jesus Christ. But these knowledgeable Christians needed to exercise love towards new believers who still imagined that idols were real and therefore could not, with a clear conscience, eat food sacrificed to those idols. Some Corinthians were, were converts. They had worshipped those idols. They had, been, they had partaken in those feasts and those, those uh, worship of false gods. It might be, it might be likened to, uh, to invite a recovering alcoholic to go to the bar to get a burger with you or something. I mean, it would not be a good idea. And, and that's how it was for these former uh, idol worshipers. It was not a good idea to... to uh, Ask them to eat the meat that had been offered to idols. Since uh, Christian, Corinthian Christians' relationships to God were not affected either by eating food or abstaining from it, they needed a set of principles to guide their dietary decisions in light of its effect on other believers. Let's read verse 8. I'm going to drop down to verse 8. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not, are we the worse? So we're going to apply. We're going to apply some Christian liberty principles. This is Roman numeral two. Applying Christian liberty principles. Even the Bible, I'm sorry. Even if the Bible does not specifically name a questionable activity, we can apply a number of principles in deciding our position on it. God encouraged His Corinthian readers first to be considerate of spiritually weaker believers. Letter A. Be considerate of weaker Christians. Although a believer in Corinth might claim Christian liberty in eating food offered to idols, Paul advised him to consider how this would affect weaker believers. Let's look at verse 9. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. If a weaker believer observed him in the act of eating sacrificed food, the weaker believer might be emboldened to eat the sacrificed food in violent or in violation of his own conscience, which would be sin. Verse 10. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to, offered to idols? This is harmful to babes in Christ. That's what we call Christian Newborn Christians, babes in Christ, babes, the weakest and most innocent of saints whom Jesus Christ died for. Christ has a particular care for the lambs of the flock. He gathers them in his arms and carries them in his bosom. We must be careful not to offend a new, younger, and weaker brother. Although the knowledgeable believers would not be ensnared by the, by the pagan beliefs and practices associated with eating these sacrificed foods, the weaker believer, having already violated his conscience, might be tempted to go even further into active disobedience. The knowledgeable Christian would be sinning against Christ by injuring the weaker believer. Paul's appeal to the knowledgeable believers then was to be considerate of weaker believers and control their use of liberty in order to avoid deterring that spiritual progress in others. We're going to read 11 through 13. And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. 
But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. That was Paul's attitude. He wasn't going to do it if it would offend someone. In all areas, in all areas, shouldn't we watch and protect the weaker? I think it's just natural. If we have somebody who's handicapped, somebody who would be blind or, or old or poor, whatever the case might be, Jesus said, yes, you've done it unto them. It's as if you did it unto me. Not sure how this example relates, but my parents taught me when I was driving and learning to drive that you cannot demand the right of way. If you come to a four-way stop and you know that it's your turn and somebody else goes, you can't demand and just go anyways. You'll cause an accident. You might not be, you might not be at fault. It might be the other guy's fault. But nobody wants to be in an accident. You can't demand uh, your right, the right of way. All right, so letter B now is exercising self-control. Self-control. In Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul used several illustrations to make one basic point at the end of the chapter. chapter. Managing Christian liberty through self-control will help the disciplined believer to run like an athlete towards his eternal reward. But before Paul could lay out his arguments that led to this conclusion, he needed to address the fact that some believers in Corinth question his apostleship and his motives for preaching. Paul carried genuine apostolic credentials. Jesus personally commissioned him, and the Corinthians uh, Christians themselves were evidence to that, that the Lord had blessed his apostolic ministry. Let's read verses 1 and 2 of chapter 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not ye my work in the Lord? If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. For the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. As an apostle, Paul could claim the same liberty and privileges as other Christian workers. He was free to marry and to receive financial support from the churches whom he ministered to. Nevertheless, for the sake of the gospel, Paul applied the principle of self-control and set aside these privileges. Let's look at uh, verse 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not issued this power but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel. Opposition from without and discouragement from within, from false brethren. It's nothing new to be beat up when you're standing for the truth, whether it's doctrine or separation. Being an eyewitness of Christ after his resurrection was an important characteristic as an apostle. You are my proof, he said in verse number two. The Corinthian church should have had the most respect for Paul. He had showed them to Christ. He had labored for nearly two years with them. Should not he have his physical needs met by the church? And if I did have a wife, her needs as well? A soldier deserves his pay. In, in verses 7 through 11, a soldier deserves his pay. A vineyard husbandman, a shepherd, they deserve to eat of the vine, to drink of the milk of the flock. God wasn't so concerned for oxen. You remember the example in the... In the Bible, where the ox should not be muzzled that treads out the corn, and, uh, and the workman is worthy of his hire. It's not that God was so concerned about, about oxen. He was using that as an example for man. Paul had ne neglected to claim his right in times past. He was not maintained at their cost. He worked to support himself. From other churches, he received support but not here from the Corinthians. And he's not threatening to claim his due now. He denies himself for their sakes and the sake of the gospel. Paul, he believed the Lord would supply his needs. Obviously, Paul's motives as an apostle were pure. Let's read 17 and 18. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospels committed unto me. Uh, Paul chose to limit his liberty for three reasons, for three reasons. Number one, to set an example devoid of criticism, lest we should hinder the gospel. 
That's in verse number 12, lest we should hinder the gospel. To place a check on his own motives to ensure that he would be qualified for heavenly reward. If I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. We just read that. And number three, to discipline himself from going beyond that which was actually at, he was at, actually at liberty to do. He says, that I abuse not my power in verse 18. What is my reward then, verse 18? Verily, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my gospel, I abuse not my power in the gospel. All right, so he, didn't want, he did not want to abuse his, his uh, power. Now we're going to go down to uh, chapter, still chapter 9 and verse 19. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews, to them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Verse 21, to them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. Verse 22, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might, by all means, save some. Paul ministered with a servant's heart among the Jews and the Gentiles alike. Through his Christian liberty, though his Christian liberty, I'm sorry, had excused him from the demands of the law, he became as a Jew in order to win the Jews to Christ. Among Gentiles, he lived apart from the Jewish law in order to win the Gentiles. In the spirit of self-control, he was considerate of all because he wanted to win people to Christ. Paul was born free, a Roman. He acted as a servant to make more converts. To Jews, he obeyed Jewish laws. To Gentiles, he behaved as one not under the law. Paul would gladly deny himself to win someone to Christ. Let's, let's uh, finish up there with 23 and 20, or just 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Some have used Paul's summary, I am made all things to all men, as an excuse to employ bizarre behavior that will supposedly enhance the ministry or make it appear culturally relevant to unbelievers. However, Paul is is uh, clearly considering limiting his liberty, not extending it, for the sole purpose of proclaiming the gospel. In fact, Christian liberty functions best within the bounds of self-control. We are not free to do whatever we feel like doing. Unchecked fleshly impulses would surely wreak, I'm sorry, sorry, would surely wreck our testimony and Christian service record. Knowing this, Paul disciplined himself Like a dedicated and well-trained runner, he kept his eye on the finish line and the winner's crown. Let's read 24 through 26. Know ye not that they which run a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Paul gave others great encouragement to act this way. He had a glorious prize, an incorruptible crown in view. He compared it to a race. Everyone can compare or can relate to a race. In junior high school, when I was at Schaff Junior High School in Parma, they had a track out back. I remember it was cinder, and uh, we went out there one spring day, and uh, that track was long. That, I, it was long, and I, our, our uh, physical education teacher, Mr. Drago, who I later met at uh, Brooklyn High School as a wrestling coach, he wanted everybody in that class to run one mile. That's four laps. Run one mile. Now listen. Mr. Drago may have wanted us all to, want to run one mile, but there was no way that I was going to be able to do that. You talk about childhood obesity. Well, that's nothing new. See, I was obese before I could spell obese. And, uh, and, and I, I was not able to finish that one mile. 
My brother Jeff probably could. I'll never forget when he said he ran all the way home from elementary school, Thoreau Park. It was a quarter of a mile. At the time, it seemed like an eternity. We walked to school, and I thought it took us a half an hour, but it probably only took us about 12 minutes. But he ran all the way home because he would run home for lunch, eat lunch at home sometimes, and come right back. I couldn't do that. I don't know if I could do it now. I'm sure I couldn't do it now. My sister, Judy, she ran in the Akron Marathon. And, and uh, we went to that to encourage her, to cheer her on. It was probably, I don't know, eight or ten years ago. I don't even remember. But something that I never expected, when we were in the, in the Akron Stadium, where the, uh, where the baseball team plays, when, when they were coming in, from the end of that marathon, it was an emotional experience. Just sitting there in the stands, I mean, I was getting choked up watching these people that, that had given it their all. And it was a great accomplishment to finish, to finish a marathon, that's for sure. But Paul, he wanted, he wanted to do more than finish. He wanted to win. Paul wanted to obtain. That was his goal. Serious athletes keep strict diets and discipline. They restrain themselves from any indulgence that would jeopardize their physical abilities. In, in verse 26, it says, uh, Certainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. Maybe you're familiar with shadow boxing. Adrian, I think, used to box. And uh, maybe you're familiar with, familiar with shadow boxing. It's a good workout. And you can sweat a lot, but it's not like a real fight. It's not the same. It's not the same. And here, here's what he says in verse number 27. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. A castaway. I think of another word for that is being disqualified. Disqualified in a, in a sporting event. I have an example. About 40 years ago, George Brett playing for the uh, Kansas City Royals against the Yankees. It was the top of the ninth inning, and the Royals were losing. He hit a home run to give his team the lead over the Yankees. But the manager of the Yankees, Billy Martin, you might remember, he, he uh, went to the umpire and he said, there's something wrong with that bat. There's something wrong. The pine tar on that bat, which gives it a good stickiness to stay in his hand, is too far up the bat. That, should, that home run shouldn't be allowed. The umpire took the bat and measured how far the pine tar went up, and sure enough, it exceeded the 18 inches that it was allowed to be. He called George Brett out, and they lost the game. He was disqualified. He was disqualified because of just that. I happen to know that they, they appealed it, and uh, George Brett was reinstated. He was not reinstated, but the home run did count. And the Royals did win the game. But for a while, he was disqualified, and, and Paul did not want that. What disciplines strengthen a believer in his walk with the Lord? What kind of disciplines should we be doing that would strengthen us? Bible reading, studying our Bible, meditating, prayer, all right? Sharing the gospel, worshiping, praising the Lord. All of these things will strengthen our walk with the Lord. Letter C is separate from sin. Separate from sin. Having raised the sad possibility of being disqualified for a reward, Paul reflected upon what had happened to the Israelites who lacked spiritual discipline in Moses' era. The Jews were delivered from bondage in Egypt. You might remember that. Under, under a cloud, they followed, God led them with a cloud, and it was a cloud that was bright as fire on one side, and it was cloudy enough to maybe shelter them from the harmful rays of the sun on the other. They passed through the Red Sea while the Egyptians drowned. I'm sure you remember that. Although God had redeemed all the Israelites from Egypt and directed, their, directed them in the wilderness and fed them and given them water from the rock, he overthrew them there. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 6. Moreover, brethren, I would not have ye, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that our father, all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea 
and did all eat the same spiritual meat. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. They were done for our example. Don't lust after evil things. God fed them manna. But they weren't satisfied with manna. They wanted meat. They wanted meat. He gave them warnings. They failed to practice self-control in obedience to God. They reveled in golden calf idolatry and committed fornication. Also, the unfaithful Israelites put God to the test and murmured that he was unfair. Again, God responded with judgment. He gave them warnings against idolatry. And what did they do? They worshiped and they created, they made and worshiped the golden calf. He gave them warnings against fornication, which they didn't heed. He gave them warnings and they provoked him. They provoked him to, to, and he was angry. He sent fiery serpents. You might remember that. And many, many of them died from uh, the, the bites from the snakes. And these are all examples to us, the examples for us. 1 Corinthians 10.20, let's read that. Uh, 20. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. I'm sure of that. These Corinthians who felt that they could exercise their Christian liberty by participating in idol feasts were running the risk of falling into sin. They felt, if they fell, they could not blame it on God. Let's read uh, chapter... 10, still verse 11. I'm going back. 11 through, I think, 14. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Verse 13. Many of us are familiar with this. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted, Above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. Verse 13, don't be terrified, don't despair. And this is why, either our trials will be proportional to our strength, or our strength will be supplied in proportion to our temptations. This is uh, talking about verse 13. No valley so dark that he can't help us find our way through it. No affliction so grievous that he can't prevent or remove or enable us to support it and in the end overrule it. And then in verse 14, he speaks, my dearly beloved, he shows tender affection. Idolatry, he says, flee from idolatry. And idolatry is taking the true God's worship and honor and giving it to his rival. No wonder God hates that. He's a jealous God, and he, doesn't, and he doesn't appreciate that. The idol feasts in Corinth reeked of demonic influence and were not fit for the presence of those who fellowshiped with Christ. The pagan Corinthians, who thought that they were offering sacrifices to their false gods, would have been in terror if they truly understood the connection they were forming with demons. Those of the church who ignored this principle of separation would face the judgment of a jealous God. If eating meat, if eating meat offered to idols was part of a heathen sacrifice, that was surely idolatry. Having fellowship with devils, that's what the Gentiles sacrificed to, to devils. That is why we examine ourselves when coming to the Lord's table. Let's read verses 16 through 19. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. Behold, Israel, after the flesh, are not they which eat of the sacrifices partakers at the altar? What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered to the idols, which is offered in sacrifice to the idols, is anything? And then I read verse 20, but I say that these things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. Ye cannot drink 
the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. It's why we examine ourselves before we come to the Lord's table. Uh, there's a good probability that many of these Corinthians made light at being at these heathen feasts. They didn't feel that it affected them, but our God is a jealous God, and there's no reason for us to be foolish enough to provoke him. All right, so letter E, I think I, I may, maybe didn't say, letter D is to edify others. Uh, apparently, some Christians pushed their liberty to the point where they felt free to do anything. Paul differentiated for them between what is lawful and what is expedient. We read that again last week, too. And between what is lawful and what will edify. Let's read verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. You remember, edify is to build someone up, to encourage. An important guiding principle in deciding this course of action is not, do I have the right to do this? But is how will this impact someone else? Let's look at uh, 24. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. Look out for the other guy. That's what, that's what Paul's saying. Okay, so now our letter, uh, uh, letter E, keep a clear conscience. Keep a clear conscience. Paul gives some guidelines here. He says, if a believer purchased a cut of meat in a Corinthian butcher shop, he should eat it with a clear conscience and not investigate its origin. After all, the, Lord's, the Lord owns the whole earth, including the food supply. Similarly, if a believer sat at a Corinthian table as a dinner guest, he should not ask, hey, where did this food come from, but rather eat it with a clear conscience. However, if the butcher or the host volunteered that the meat had been offered to idols, the believer should not eat, lest he set a poor example of indifference to the, sig and, uh, to the significance of pagan religious symbols. If a stronger Christian ignored others' concerns, his Christian liberty might be interpreted as a license to sin. Anytime a believer eats, he must do so in a manner that would cause him and those around him to give thanks. And letter F is to glorify God. Though Paul had given us some principles that may be complicated both to understand and to practice, he concludes in these three chapters uh, with an unmistakable clear command and that is to give glory to God. Look at verse 31. Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give all, do all to the glory of God. If a Christian conducted himself in a way that glorified God, he would not purposely offend Jew or Gentile or the church of God. That's what he says in verse 32. Paul's goal was to strengthen Christians and to bring non-Christians to Christ. May we, like Paul, be so consumed with the spiritual needs of others that our trifling preferences will fade in comparison. So in closing, I just wanted to review these. I think there's six principles for practicing liberty. Number one is to be considerate, be considerate of others. Number two is to exercise self-control. Number three is to flee from sin. Number four is to edify others. Number five is to keep a clear conscience and last but not least is to glorify God in everything we do. All right, let's be dismissed after a word of prayer, Lord. Thank you for this lesson. Thank you for these guidelines, Lord, helping us to understand how we should treat some questionable things. Uh, they, could, they could be things that uh, are in our day right now, Lord, whether it would be dress or whether it would be music or whatever it might be, Lord, uh, it could be something that could be a stumbling block to someone else, and we might feel okay with it. Help us to be considerate, considerate of the weaker brethren and uh, of others, Lord, who might be offended. I pray, Lord, that you'll bless us as we, as we leave, as we go home. Bring us back Sunday uh, for a great Sunday. We're looking forward to our guest speaker, Mr. Prater. And uh, pray, Lord, that you will bless the couples on the couples' retreat this weekend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.